at the heart of a nation for a thousand years. Edward III is over there, Richard II is over there. Be it weddings or coronations, the Abbey is the royal church. It's better our fingers get thorns than the royal fingers. But behind the pomp and circumstance... Mother of God, stand, you know, still singing, everything wonderful, beautiful and lovely. ...is the spit, polish and perfectionism... You can spend too long being perfect. There we go, that'll do. ...of the folk who make it happen. I might just drop this now. From the altar to the crypt... Anything that the clergy need, that's what we're here for. Oh, sorry, 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 excuse me. From the nave to the roof... The things you do for the Abbey. It all runs on meticulous planning. It's a live service. Everything has to be absolutely perfect. And a wing and a prayer. Don't work with children, don't work with animals, don't work with candles. Welcome to Westminster Abbey. This time, history in the making, after the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We're talking shortly after a state funeral. We found ourselves right at the heart of a national moment. The choristers prepare for the unexpected. A moment of realization for the dean. This is the manner in which the king is to be crowned. Good gracious. And the royal treasures come out. It might need just a wipe, I think, with a cloth. For a prince and his knights. Westminster Abbey, the Royal Church, a place of coronation and national memorial. But today will be a first in the Abbey's 1,000-year history, an even song with a twist. It's a completely different congregation today. Um, most of the congregation is dressed in leather. And the area outside the Great West Door, the usual arrival place for the limos of VIPs and royals, is filling up with Hondas, Harleys and Triumphs. So we've got a special even song today with blessing of the motorbikes of the 59 Club. So an, another first for the Abbey. We've not had a motorbike inside, that's for sure. But these are no Hell's Angels. Taking its name from the year it was founded, the 59 Motorcycle Club started as a youth club, run from a church in London's East End. My wife's a church warden, so I said, I'm coming to head office today, get a blessing. <laughs> we won't be getting too carried away with ourselves. We will follow the rules and instructions of the Abbey, as we all do. Clerk of the Works and keen biker Ian Bartlett is joining in the fun. I've had bikes since I was literally six or seven, so it's something that I've done for decades. So it, it's part of me, really. This is saying, actually, everybody's welcome here. Whatever you're into, whatever you enjoy, whatever you wear, you are welcome at Westminster Abbey. You're part of our story. It's so exciting. It's just nice to have something different to, to do with a, your usual even song. For the 59 Club, on its 60th anniversary, the first white Cassocks and leathers mix for a service which culminates with an unusual blessing from the Dean. Bless the 59. May we always travel in hope. And through your mercy, we, may we complete the course set before us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Really good. Good atmosphere. The Dean really enjoyed it. And you can hear all the bikes going now. Good noise. I like that noise. Who knows? Could be a new tradition. <laughs> Part of the great variety of the life in the Abbey. This is probably at one extreme, but that's great. <laughs> bikes blessed and bikers gone. It's time for the Abbey to let the tourists back in. All your tourists are just there. Enjoy your visit. Here you go. Brilliant. Excellent. Have a great time. Thank you. With her service duties over, Marshall Daisy is back in tour guide mode. So this is a coronation chair. So every coronation since William the Conqueror, Christmas Day 1066, has happened at Westminster Abbey. This royal seat of power is kept safely locked in a side chapel 
until the day it's needed again. The coronation chair, however, has been used at every coronation since 1308, with Edward II being the first um, to be crowned on the chair. It's all made of solid oak. I've been told it takes six big men to carry it. I wouldn't want to be that person. Nah, -uh. no way. Under close inspection, it's clear that the centuries have left their mark. When the chair was made, it would have been covered in gold gilt. You can still see remains of it on the sides, especially around the top. It would have just been gleaming. But I think to stand in front of probably the oldest still used piece of furniture in the UK is something. And all the people that have sat on it is just, it's incredible. Within the Abbey's books and records is the story of its centuries-long relationship with the monarchy, all kept under the close eye of Head of Collections, Tony Trowles. But the most precious volume of them all is under lock and key in the Abbey galleries, which today needs some careful attention. We're going to take this manuscript out of the case and change the opening so that it's open at a different page, so that the same picture isn't getting uh, light all the time. It's a rare occasion, one the Dean doesn't want to miss. Hi. Hello. Yes, I thought you I might thought. like to see it, because I know you haven't seen it out of its I case. never it's, have. So we will very carefully. The Dean's interest is not merely academic. The Liber Regalis, or Royal Book, is an Abbey how-to guide passed down over the centuries. The reason it's still here is because it's a coronation manual. It tells you how to do a coronation. So this, this book is right at the heart of what we do when we come to the biggest service we ever have. Indeed, and this manuscript begins in Latin. This is the manner in which the king is to be crowned. So right from the start, it's telling you how the abbey is to be prepared. Good gracious. The Liber Regalis was first written for a medieval royal whose tomb lies directly below them. So 1380s, uh, this is Richard II and his wife Anne of Bohemia, who are by the shrine. Yes, we think this may have been written for the coronation of Anne of Bohemia. And it's influenced the crowning of monarchs ever since. What's very important is that there is a direct line of descent from the order of service laid out here to the order of service that was used in 1953. So in 1953, when Elizabeth II had is crowned in the Abbey, this isn't the text we use, but this is absolutely formative. There have, of course, been changes over the centuries. But all those elements of the coronation service, taking of an oath, the recognition by the people, the anointing, the most central act, the crowning, they're all here in the, in the order in which we have come to, to be familiar with them over the, over the years. And we can expect all that to inform another coronation in due course, yeah? Yes. Around the same time as the Liber Regalis was written, the Abbey gained a choir, which has been at the heart of royal occasions ever since. Four and a half centuries ago, the Abbey started training boys to sing in its services, and currently its choir school takes boys from 8 to 13. Today, nine-year-old Cleveland has a lot on his mind. I'm not sure if I actually want to turn 10. I kind of want to stay as a child and not grow up. And with his birthday tomorrow, he has a big decision to make. I think my favourite ever, ever one was when I was turning, I think, four, and my mum made a cake in the shape of a dragon, which was really amazing. But during term time, birthday cake baking is taken care of by the school kitchen. But well, important question first, have you decided on a birthday cake? Um, I have, yes. Definitely. Should we go and see um, Chef and let him know? And lads, if you can go off to your lesson, that'd be okay, brilliant. Sure. Thank you. Headmaster Mr Roberts is helping Cleveland to narrow it down. So it's a real chocolate theme. What, so dark chocolate, 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 chocolate fudge, fudge and... Dark chocolate fudge. Dark chocolate fudge, dark chocolate fudge. all right. Deliberations over, Cleveland puts in his request. OK, um, perfect. That's ready for you. OK, thank you very much, Carlos. Let's leave it tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye. Coming up... We just need to open up the, open coffin. Up the coffin. I know you haven't right. seen it yet. The hunt for a lost Tudor royal. There it is. Here we are. And the choir must be ready for anything. <laughs> <laughs>
it doesn't matter whether or not they're singing for somebody they've never met or somebody who's the most important person in our country. Early morning in the Lady Chapel, and as the sun pours through the east-facing windows... So keep the weight on the yes, altar, I think. Know. So I need the tapes at the back. Virgis, Alice and Andrew are dressing one of its altars. Mm. All right, go and get the front. OK, let's see if it hangs properly at the front. There we go. This one's a nice altar frontal as well. It's got the cross keys of St Peter. Beautiful. You OK again? OK. Good. That's the first time in nine years I've managed that. Hidden behind the Lady Chapel is the little cloister, once used by monks as an infirmary. Today, it's where senior staff and clergy have their homes, including Canon David Stanton. Looking up here, you see the Victoria Tower, and the flag up there is the size of a tennis court, an extraordinary thing to, to look at from one's garden. David's garden may have extraordinary views, but as a place to grow plants, it has its drawbacks. The whole of the abbey is built on an island, Lithorny Island, and because of that, there's a medieval concrete platform underneath, and that means the ground drains extremely quickly, so as soon as one waters the garden, you need to do it again. As sub dean David has many administrative duties, but he's also a keen cricketer and coaches the pupils from the Abbey's choir school. The daily pattern is really very focused for the boys, and they start off with their, their practice in the morning, then they've got lessons, then another practice before Evensong, and then singing Evensong itself. Uh, so it's a very action-packed day. We've got our normal cricket session with Canon Stanton, so we just need to get the people who are normally doing that. But also, they've got to be able to unwind, they've got to be boys, and they can't just be uh, mini-adults the whole time. Do you all need a bat? So maybe j just take a couple or a few. Well done. Despite the boys having song school and even song still to come, there's just enough time to squeeze in some sport. So we're going to start off with the slip-catching practice. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Excellent. Canon Stanton here is our vice dean and in years gone by was a very accomplished cricketer. So he's helping these lads get ready. Uh, we've got a game against St Paul's coming up. What we're going to do now is have a little bit of batting coaching. So when you, when you hit the ball, you roll your wrists down like that. So you hit the ball into the ground, OK? Yeah, excellent. Well done. That's super. The coaching a hit, it's back to timetable classes for the boys. Right, that's the end of today's practice. Until their chorister duties later on. Are you on for even song tonight? Yes. Right, I'll see you there. All in our different kit. Later today, the Abbey will welcome the Prince of Wales. Meanwhile, Amongst the ancient documents, Matthew Payne searches for evidence of a far earlier royal. So this is one of the early burial lists for the abbey that survived, 16th century burial list. A few years ago, a coffin was discovered on the south side of the Lady Chapel, a very high status coffin, an anthropoid coffin, that is in the shape of a human. Extremely rich and high status people had coffins like that. There are very, very few survived. It's now housed in the Abbey's attic storeroom, and Matthew has a theory that its occupant could be a Tudor. I have a suspicion that there's only one or two candidates who might fit the bill for that sort of high-status coffin, and one in particular who I have my eye on, and we don't know what happened to him. He'd only been buried there three years before the Old Lady Chapel was pulled down. The current Lady Chapel was built by the first Tudor monarch, King Henry VII, in 1516, and is home to 15 kings and queens. X marks the spot. The coffin was found close to the chapel walls. To find its exact location, Matthew has enlisted the help of his colleague, curator Dr. Susan Jenkins. Here we are. This is the site. Yep. And Susan confirms that a number of lead coffins were found at this location. 
So we found the three. One remains in place. Two were excavated, conserved, and now upstairs. And that one of them is anthropoid, yes. which is incredibly yeah. rare. Being just outside the Lady Chapel, Matthew believes that the coffins are likely to belong to a period before it was built. I suspect that must mean, if it's not a chapel here, that they were displaced from the old Lady Chapel and reburied. We found out that um, as the Abbey is a royal peculiar, mm. we needed to get a special license from the Ministry of Justice, a license for the removal of human remains. Susan was present when the graves were first excavated. The process of excavating them was incredibly carefully done because they're so fragile and you can see the archaeologists very carefully digging around yeah. to, to get them out of the ground, them. not actually opening the coffins. That happened because um, the lids were soldered on. The bones that were found were then bagged up, not a full skeleton, but an incredibly exciting mm. find for everybody. Now it's down to Matthew to try to fill in the blanks. Extremely rare, extremely important, probably early, and we're really excited about seeing what you can unearth. Could one of them be the coffin of a missing royal? Matthew needs to see for himself. I'm very much looking forward to showing you the coffin. Shall I can't we? wait to see them. Let's go and have a look. Over at Song School, it's rehearsal time, and Abbey Choir Master James O'Donnell knows he needs to keep his choristers singing at the highest level. Right, let's, is everybody ready? Can you be quick over there, please? Cut them. Could somebody close the doors? Thank you very much. James is acutely aware that a regular even song rehearsal like this could suddenly be replaced by one for a major royal service. Which means birthday boy Cleven is having to work hard for his cake. What does Poco Rit mean? Uh, slowing, down slowing down a lot? Poco? Molto is a lot. Poco is a bit. Yeah. How much? How much? As much as the conductor's face. Right. So it also means watch, doesn't it? And I love I think if I hadn't bashed the piano harder, that, that crescendo wouldn't really have happened. So I'm not going to be playing the piano even song. OK, so you have to do it. One. And the... the Choir of Westminster Abbey is unique because it is there both to sing the daily services. At the same time, if we have a state funeral, a coronation, a royal wedding, it's a building that allows the nation to come together. And the choir is what allows people um, to access those services. Malta Sostenuto. And then keep that feel. Need a bit more gut on glory. Seven stories above the abbey's nave is the Triforium, a treasure trove of relics old and new. Susan and Matthew are heading up here to try and identify the mystery occupant of a very special coffin. We just need to open up the, open coffin. Up the coffin. I know you haven't right. seen it yet. Um, oh, well, that's there. OK. And it's the whole sheet, and isn't it? There we are. Wow. It's fantastic. There it is. We broadly think, though I know you've got um, ideas, that it's somewhere between 1400 and 1500. It's extremely rare with this wonderful cast lead rope cross decoration and this stamped floriated motif. We've got six of them, one right in the middle of the head, one at the foot and four around the cross. And the most important thing is the anthropoid shape which is in the shape of a, of a human, and therefore the question for whom it was created. The royals that were buried in the old lady chapel have all been accounted for, except for one missing Viscount. The only royal unaccounted for was John Viscount Wells, uncle of Henry VII. Mm. So my suspicion is that that's who we have here. 
a big figure. He fought yeah. at Bosworth alongside Henry VII, a very trusted member of the royal household. The Battle of Bosworth saw Henry Tudor defeat Richard III to become King Henry VII. Whilst the first Tudor monarch lies inside the abbey, the grave of his uncle, Viscount Wells, was thought lost until now. So it may remain a hypothesis, but I think the most plausible candidate that we know of. So lost Tudor, probably. It's five o'clock, and the choir, who have come straight from rehearsals, process through the nave for evensong. People often ask, is it different if the royal family turns up for a service? And on one level, of course it is. But ultimately, these boys are trained to turn up and sing. And it shouldn't matter, and in a sense doesn't matter, whether or not they're singing for somebody they've never met or somebody who's the most important person in our country. The boys know what their job is and they do it well. At the end of a long day, the Abbey's choristers enjoy a well-earned supper. And birthday boy Cleven has discovered that turning ten wasn't so bad after all. It feels basically the same as being nine. And he's looking forward to dessert. I chose chocolate fudge. Which is served accompanied by a well-known song, which is, of course, pitch perfect. If you're part of a group of children living away from home, you've got to have a birthday party. You've got to have a cake. They're, they're growing up, and you know people are only here for about four or five years. So it's it's nice to see them having their birthdays. It's also a slight reminder that you know time's marching on. So in all of these things, you get to see really, I suppose, the Abbey moving through the years. The person in charge of Westminster Abbey is the Sovereign. And soon the Abbey will be hosting another royal service, which this time will take place in its Tudor-built extension. This is uh, the Lady Chapel in Westminster Abbey. As well as being the Lady Chapel, it's the Chapel of the Order of the Bath. So all these uh, extraordinary coloured standards and all the stalls, uh, they're there for the Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath. So this would be number five, oh, number, five that's it. number five, yeah. So why don't we pop that down there? We know that's good. After the pillar, we should have wicks and then Stanhope. Deputy Clerk of the Works, Ian MacDonald and his team are preparing the chapel for the Order of the Bath service. We have a lot to do uh, with the crests and the flags, but in this instance, we're installing all the plaques in preparation for the, for the upcoming event. For Ian, this will be his first. How are we? Good, Thank yourself? You. Fortunately, Head of Events Lorraine knows the score. So this is a, a ceremony that we do every four years, so it's quite yeah, a Yeah, I've not seen this one yet. It's a very special service. All the other guests stay behind in the main body of the church, so it's quite a, a private yeah. installation and the Incoming knights and now dames will take an oath and then be um, installed. Evoking the spirit of chivalrous knights in shining armour, this medieval honour was revived 300 years ago. Each new member of the order gets their coat of arms attached to a stall in the chapel. How many have you put up? Yeah, there's seven up. Uh, yep. They're all around. Well, welcome to go and have a look. We've yep. put them up on all the stalls okay. uh, on the north and south. Lovely. But locating the new stall plates among centuries of others is easier said than done. Stefan, help me. I've got to find them. Hopefully I'll just blend it in. You do such a good job that they all look exactly oh, the same, Ian. 
ball pews. Isn't that this lovely? One? It's really bright. It's quite spectacular. A quick lap of the chapel confirms that each new knight's plaque is where it should be. Good job. Well done. All right. Thank you. The Prince of Wales is due to attend, so there's no room for mistakes. They all fit and they all look beautiful and they're all in the right place. And although the name of the knighthood might suggest a nice warm bath, these days there's no water involved. In medieval times, the persons that were going to be installed had to take a bath, a spiritual bath, the night before their installation. Preparations for the royal service might be in full swing, but the abbey still needs to open up for paying visitors. The success of the visitor experience team has been a vital financial shot in the arm for the abbey. But managing a large number of tourists comes with its own problems and a large amount of clutter. So this is the point of arrival in Westminster Abbey. Great big glazed lobby, not very beautiful. Piles of paper. Ptolemy Dean is the abbey's surveyor of the fabric and was the architect behind the new Western Tower. This place is close to his heart. So I've just reached the crossing point of this fantastic abbey building, rebuilt in the 1250s by Henry III on the site of Edward the Confessor's earlier building. It was the latest thing in Gothic architecture at the time, and it is without parallel in this country. It is such a privilege to work here. He's concerned that the facilities needed to manage the high volume of visitors means that in places, his beloved abbey is beginning to emulate an airport lounge. It does have something of a hint of Gatwick about it, particularly at a busy time. And this place is such a marvelous building. You know, it's one of the great buildings of the world. You know, surely we can find a way of sorting this out. He's not keen on the stacks of chairs either. And these are all the chairs that get moved for special occasions, but there's nowhere to store them. I mean, this is a very important aisle, parallel to the cloisters, and yet it's out of use and out of access. So we need a project that accommodates the storage and gets rid of all these sorts of things. Ptolemy believes the solution lies in here. So this is the medieval sacristy. This is Marshall Daisy is leading a tour around the remains of the Abbey's great sacristy, which was demolished 300 years ago. So within this building, this is where the monks at the time would have looked after any of like the altar linens and the vestments that they wear before going in for services. Beneath the medieval sacristy are earlier graves. Mostly the archaeologists think that they are probably around the period of when Edward the Confessor was building his church. So around the 1040 mark. I think it's quite spooky. I mean, nobody ever says it, they get a spooky atmosphere, but I think I'd be a bit creeped out living here. <laughs> spooky or not, Ptolemy has big plans for the old sacristy. So the future use of this building will be that people will come and enter through a new door, which will be located round about here, and then they'll be able to move through here and buy their tickets. So removing all of those desks and things that we saw in the North Transept, all that goes. Hello, yes, thank you very much for bringing the voucher. Just here, we built a sample of the new building, which is going to be stone with a seat. This is a mock-up of a piece of Westminster Abbey that is missing, and uh, all we need to do is just get on and build it. The Abbey has the planning permission, but there's a catch. It's a really important building. It had to stop because COVID meant that we simply didn't have the finances. We very much hope that we will be able to do that in the next few years. One project that did get the go-ahead is the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Galleries, overseen by curator Susan Jenkins. It's a working collection, and many of its treasures are much more than museum pieces. Afternoon. Martin, hello, How are you? hello. It's in good condition. Yes. It might need just a wipe, I think, with a cloth, okay. just to buff it up a bit, but it okay. looks lovely. Hopefully. 
Martin the Dean's verger has come up to collect the bath plate, which will be the centerpiece of the upcoming service. All we need to do now, Susan, if we can, just take it from its position, put it in its box, and if you hand it then over it to me officially, and I'll take it away. Yeah, then it's I'll in your custody. It's in my custody. Yeah. I'll use it on um, when we set up the Lady Chapel ready for the main rehearsal. And with some final delicate handling. Ooh. Ooh. Very carefully. Hold on. Very carefully from the stand. Is it clipped in? Yes. There, oh, you, there you are. No, Great. Well, that's a good and the bath it. plate will now go from just another exhibition piece to playing a starring role. Have, have a good service. Yeah, good thank luck. You. And I promise to return it. To yes, you. thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Down below, Martin has entrusted the priceless bath plate to two allegedly reliable vergers. If you leave any fingerprints, make sure they don't match the police file. What? <laughs> who transport it to the Lady Chapel, ready for today's ceremony. It's nice to see the clergy chairs out. Oh, yes. Is it minor canons? So, Stephen, I think we need to take the dust cloth off. Okay, ready to receive? I am ready, yes. Ready yeah, to let's uh, place the plate on the altar. Okay. Keep those fingerprints off it. Indeed. Bath plate in position. Soon the rehearsals will begin. Back in the galleries are some very royal treasures, which may also need to come out of their cases one day. Here we have our replica regalia. This is one of the points where I always have to pause and just think, oh my word, because this takes us right to the heart of the coronation, doesn't it? It's a service the Dean will need to know inside out. These have a real purpose, these are objects which are used for rehearsals, for coronation. So that people who have to carry things in procession and, and hand things to other people during the service had something that, that resembled what they would actually have on the day. How extraordinary. An expert in Abbey history, the head of collections knows how things were done in coronations past. One of the roles of the Dean is to take each item of regalia from the high altar, altar. and to hand it to the archbishop. So it's quite important that I know for which the dean of Westminster that, that, that he knows. The St Edward's crown is used only for crowning. The sovereign, in fact, doesn't wear that crown outside the abbey. No. The imperial state crown is put on at the end of the service for leaving the abbey. And that's the one that we're familiar with from watching State Opening of Parliament. I was there just the other day and I saw it being carried in. Even with the right crown at the right time, the best laid plans didn't always come off. At the coronation of the Queen's father, George VI, in 1937, the Archbishop was very concerned about putting St Edward's crown on the right way round. Ah. And so he, he tied a very small piece of cotton to the, to the front so that he knew which was where he got it the right way round. Um, and during the preparations before the service started, a well-meaning person noticed it and removed it. <laughs> Appointed to the Abbey in 2019, the Dean still has a bit to learn. And that extraordinary eagle is in fact a container for the oil, isn't it? It is. So the, the oil that's used for the anointing is put into the body of the eagle and then there's a small hole in the beak which, out of which the archbishop really? pours the oil into the anointing Wonderful. spoon. I have no idea. <laughs> for the 39th Dean of Westminster, the truth is sinking in. I see these things quite often. I bring visitors up here. But there's another moment when you suddenly remember these are the things that are in the... Uh, Tower of London, these are the crown jewels. I might be picking one of these up one day, uh, and that, yeah, that just takes your breath away. A coronation may well lie in the future, but the latest royal service is looming. And Master of Ceremonies, Minor Canon Mark, is down on the Abbey floor. Today is the installation and oath taking of Knight's Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath. And rehearsals are in full swing. It's a full abbey, we have trumpeters, we have the choir. It's a great abbey occasion. It involves a lot of processions. And so the knights, all sort of splendidly apparelled in their sort of pomegranate pink mantles, make their way up to the Lady Chapel. 
most importantly, of course, the great master of the order is the Prince of Wales. So the ceremony now, they take an oath of allegiance to the Queen and make promises to defend her rights and to defend its widows and, and orphans. So, so they have to make a vow of social responsibility. They also offer their swords and the Dean then returns their swords to them saying, you know, you must use these responsibly. You must use them to the glory of God and to the defence of the country and of Her Majesty, not just for your own gain, as it were. Unfortunately, there is no actual bath involved. And as the state trumpeters take their positions, Prince Charles, the great master, is on his way. are back, welcoming visitors to the Tower of London hey, kids. for its most royal year yet. It's really important to us. It has to be delivered because if it isn't, I'll be spending a few nights in the Tower. A brand new series, Inside the Tower of London, starts next Thursday at 8 on Channel 5 and My 5. Delivering unexpected moments. Extraordinary stories sponsored by Prestige Flowers on Channel 5. Westminster Abbey, Tuesday the 24th of May, 2022. The Dean welcomes His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, great master of the most honorable order of the bath. The service begins, and it's time for the Knights of the Bath to be installed. Following ancient tradition, their actual installation takes place in private. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. As usual, Minor Canon Mark and his team have pulled it off. Well, that was a particularly special moment. And actually being up outside the doors of the Lady Chapel with the uh, ceremonies going on inside them, I couldn't see very much, but it was all very, clearly very intimate, very sort of, very serious, very moving. Really pleased, really pleased. All post-service clear-ups are down to the vergers. Duties that have remained largely unchanged for centuries. So we have to have morning prayer, communion and evening prayer every day. We're definitely kept very busy. <laughs> there are, of course, a few modern additions. Don't want bubbles in the wine. <laughs> but as silver chalices are not known to be dishwasher safe, Alice still has to wash up by hand. Because we've been doing this for so long, it works like clockwork. Uh, so we all know what we're doing. Um, we're a very efficient team. The vergers still verge, 
and the dean and chapters still run the abbey's business. But there are fewer of them than in medieval times, and today's chapter meetings take place in the Jerusalem chamber. So, uh, Kevin Rafus, can you begin with a prayer, please? I will indeed. Today is Ascension Day, so I'm going to read the prayer book collect for the day. Grant, we beseech the Almighty Lord. Which means that the much larger chapter house, built seven centuries ago, is no longer needed. It's a stone, relatively plain space. But actually, once you begin to explore it, you realize how much the history of our nation is there, right back to the medieval period, but is relevant today. It's a space that's directly linked to one of Canon Trisha's roles. I am the chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons, and I think I'm something like the 80th in that role. It does mean that as well as being here in the Abbey, I'm over in Parliament most days. In the 13th century, Tricia would not have had to walk so far, because back then, the chapter house was where the King's Great Council met. And the Council was effectively the beginnings of the English Parliament. Why, hello, Shannon. Hello. Lovely to see you. Welcome to your home. Oh, on this in mind that we have for us. So this is great. What have you got for me? In a switch from where they usually meet, Tricia has invited Speaker of the House of Commons, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, to visit one of the birthplaces of democracy. So, here we are. I walked past it on the outside, but to be on the inside, to actually see it now, in all its glory with the sunlight coming through. Gosh. This is spectacular. And what we see is where the speaker's chair, Abbott's chair, taken right, on by yes. the speaker, would have been right here at the bottom of this enormous pillar that leads to the vaulting. And then all the way around, there are seats for 80 monks. Or indeed, seats for the king's councillors when this early parliament was sitting. And what they would have done was to have followed the king around. But Westminster became one of the most typical places to come. And they were in the chapter house on the 28th of January, 1547, during the reign of Henry VIII. The speaker was here in the chair when Parliament oh. got the news that the king was dead. The history unfolds. I can feel it. You know, the hairs on the back of the neck go, you know, because there is something really special. The acoustics are there, aren't they? I've got to try it. Go on, go on. Order! Order! My, what better sound. I think I need to move the chamber back here. I have more authority in this room than any other. So it does make me wonder, I can't help it, that if they continued to have worked in an octagonal space rather than a choir style face facing each other, would that have made any difference? In some respects, I think it would take the confrontation out, wouldn't it? And it would be interesting. Who would you have your back to? Yeah. That's oh. always the question. <laughs> On the 8th of September, the Abbey was to put everything on hold when the sad news of the death of our reigning monarch was announced. Ten days later, Westminster Abbey, the Royal Church, the burial place of kings and queens down the centuries, held a state funeral for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We're talking shortly after a state funeral Something we've been preparing for, thinking about for years. When it comes, it's still a huge shock. And we found ourselves right at the heart of a national moment. They were just staggering days. All the Abbey staff, from beadle to verger, marshal to maintenance, chorister to clergy, everyone pulled together. We said something about the Queen in history, her significance over the ages. We brought her into a house of kings. I sat between her and Edward the Confessor and Henry III and Henry V. It was the end of an era and the beginning of another. We have just done it. First royal funeral, first sovereign's funeral in 260 years. Uh, we, we are inevitably going to be looking towards another coronation. So the eyes of the nation will be focused on Westminster Abbey, and anybody who knows anything about the Abbey will actually also have a sense that this isn't just this extraordinary moment in time, here is our present King Charles III being crowned. Actually, that coronation chair has sat exactly on that pavement for 750 years. 
Kings and queens have been crowned in exactly the same place. He has been caught up in that great national story. Uh, we're part of something that isn't just this age, but goes right through the ages. And you next Thursday night at eight, head down the river for a slice of life for beef eaters and visitors inside the Tower of London. Next tonight, news of a country on the brink of war makes its way to Yorkshire.